Hi, everyone. So I'm going to speak for the next 30 minutes or so about social sciences and ecological forecasting. So if you took a look at the blog on the FE website, or if you tuned into the RCN workshop at all, uh, you may have seen this image, uh, this image here once or twice or quite a few times. Uh, so basically, it's a diagram outlining some of the relationships between people uh, here in orange in the central column and the actions that they take in blue on the left and right. Um, all sort of within the ecological forecasting cycle. So I will speak about some of these today, but I hope that you take some time to think about each of the arrows that are here on the diagram, uh, the sort of connections between people and actions, and speak to your friendly local social scientist about what they might mean for your work. Um, so, so that's my plug for collaborating with social scientists. Uh, so social scientists look at all of the processes here, but what I'm going to focus on today is the social science related to um, a little bit the design of forecasts by scientists, um, but especially the communication and use of information, including forecasts by decision makers. So, and, um, so while people are involved in all aspects of the forecasting process, as you just saw, they're also in every system that you might be forecasting. So some of you may have heard the term the Anthropocene. Um, so it's basically the idea that the age that we're living in now is dominated by a human signal that reflects all of the ways that humans have affected like the biosphere, uh, hydrosphere, cryosphere, atmosphere. All of the spheres are affected by people um, and our signal is everywhere. So no system that you're going to be working in is going to be immune to this signal. Uh, it may come primarily through climate, um, like climate change, but the actions of people are going to be there. People affect the environment. Uh, but the idea of a couple of human and natural systems or CHAMs uh, or socio-environmental systems or a couple of natural and human systems, they have a lot of names. Um, but basically the idea of all of them is that uh, just as people are affecting the environment through their sort of human processes, the processes of the environment are also affecting people. And so there are a wide range of areas of human interest that are affected by ecological processes and where ecological forecasting likely has implications. Uh, so things like fields like public health, um, agriculture, fisheries, forests, water, even tourism and recreation. So I think a lot of your work uh, is going to be affecting or, or potentially um, informing decisions that are made in all of these sectors. So you heard from Melissa Kenny earlier this week about structured decision making, and I know that you did that exercise. Uh, so this is more about um, maybe what you might think of as kind of unstructured decisions and the things, uh, the kinds of decisions people are making every day, all the time, and sometimes even in cases where we intend to make structured decisions, we might make more unstructured decisions or might be affected by these sort of unstructured concepts. Um, so the work that I'll talk about today comes from uh, a diversity of social science fields, including kind of psychology, sociology, and economics. Largely, those are the ones I'm going to draw from, but I'm trained as a geographer, uh, and so we're going to be crossing a number of fields. And so these are all going to be about people's decision making, often departing from structured or what's often referred to as rational decisions, in part to things like biases and heuristics. So um, these are kind of the mental shortcuts that our minds provide to make decisions easier. Um, we're also affected by the social decision context, so the, the social context in which we're making our decisions, the physical context in which we're making decisions, and also how we perceive risk. So each of these could be an entire class and these are entire classes in some cases. Uh, so what I'll cover here is really going to be a high level overview. And so the takeaway really is that we should be thinking about these things and other social science issues like the ones in that diagram uh, as we design and communicate forecasts and forecast information. So first, a moment of levity. Uh, so please take a few seconds to just guess how many films you think each of these actors has appeared in. So this will be a guess. I don't actually expect you to know this um, and because I hope you just take a couple of seconds. Uh, note that the average A-list actor makes an average of about one film per year. So if you can go to the, um, the Poll Everywhere site and just enter in some guesses. So uh, Tom Hanks has appeared in 74 films and Christopher Lee has appeared in 214. So Lee is actually one of the most prolific actors of all time and also happens to be in two of my favorite film franchises. He plays uh, Saruman in the Lord of the Rings franchise, and he plays um, the man with the golden gun in a Bond film. So it's pretty likely that none of you knew this answer off the top of your head. And in making a guess, there may have been two factors that influenced the average person's response. 
and these are the anchoring bias and the availability heuristic. So I know you heard about anchoring earlier this week when you're talking about expert elicitation, uh, and it may have had an effect in this case. So the note that I gave you about one movie per year may have anchored answers in the sort of 30 to 50 film range and made it a lot less likely to guess something in the hundreds. Um, and also before I go on, I just want to make it clear. So we're going to be talking about biases and heuristics and these other kind of quote unquote irrational effects. Um, and I just want you to understand, so these are not bad things uh, that make us wrong or lead us astray in general. Uh, so these shortcuts allow us to function and make decisions almost nonstop throughout the day. The number of decisions the average person makes in the day is, is astronomical. So in many, if, mo if not most cases, the decisions we make based on kind of biases, heuristics, and these other uh, deviations um, are going to be decisions that are sort of good enough for us. Uh, they exist and we should be aware of them, but they are not sort of bad as such. So the availability heuristic may have also played a role in your guesses. Um, and this one basically means that when asked to predict a future event or condition uh, or to make a guess sort of out of sample, people most often base that not on a balanced assessment of all information, but will instead heavily lean on whatever information is most kind of available in their minds. Um, and this is often either the most recent information or condition or the one that sticks out the most in their minds, the one that's sort of the most memorable. And so media coverage actually has a lot to do with this one. Often uh, events that receive more media attention loom, uh, loom larger in people's minds, and that leads them to think of those events as being more frequent and therefore more likely than they actually are. Um, so the ease with which Tom Hanks, uh, who you know, recently appeared in a number of films, and Christopher Lee, who uh, hasn't appeared in anything very recently, um, came to mind may have affected how many films you guessed. So this effect can also be seen in things like annual performance reviews, which tend to overemphasize recent performance, even when the evidence suggests that these are poor predictors of the near or sort of um, a little bit farther out future. So these, uh, there are a few important biases that are important to keep in mind when we're thinking about communicating forecast information to potential decision makers. So these are, you know, when you're, when you're putting your, your forecast out there. Um, and the first is that people tend to be more averse to loss than they are excited by uh, gains of an equivalent amount. And this is about framing. This is about how you're communicating the information, not about the information itself. So for example, um, we can take the elusive end of year bonus. Not super popular in academia, but they do exist. Um, so it turns out that bonuses that are framed as being a default of say $5,000, for example, uh, where that's the baseline and you lose a thousand dollars or you know some amount of those dollars if you fail to do x y or z that kind of framing tends to be more effective in encouraging people to to put in that extra work than if the bonus is framed as a default of zero where you can earn a thousand dollars for doing x y or z thing and so we value those same exact thousand dollars more if we feel like we're losing it than if we feel like we're gaining it uh, so a loss framing may be more compelling but this has limitations. So when people fear too much loss, uh, they may be overcome by something called the ostrich effect, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. Too much fear, and we do the you know psychological equivalent of sticking our heads in the sand. So related to the challenge of loss framing and communicating loss is the issue of what's called finite pools of worry. And this means that people have a limited amount of energy that they can dedicate to concern at any given time. And so there's no, I mean, you know, we all know there's no such thing as a person who is only concerned about one thing at a time. We've all got sort of lots on our plates. So even when thinking about a particular decision, decision makers are often balancing multiple, sometimes conflicting concerns, and those all kind of take energy. And so people can drain this pool of worry by taking action that addresses their concerns. Um, but since everyone also has limited time and energy and resources to take action, they try to be as efficient as possible and reduce their worry with as few actions as possible, which leads to um, the thing in parentheses here, the single action bias, um, which is basically if you, 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 try to, you try to take care of chunks of concern with one thing if possible. So for a large and complex concern like climate change that a lot of people have, uh, people are often addressing this with a single action, like changing out the light bulbs, light bulbs in their house for fluorescence, or investing in solar panels, buying an electric car. And um, people tend to take a single action and then kind of cross that concern off their mental list. Uh, and so this might be important for when you're thinking about maybe the frequency of forecast information or the frequency that people are going to be um, 
presented with this new information that's encouraging them to take a new or different action, um, you know, sort of when they're the the items that are associated with your forecast are going to be, you know, going back into their pool of worry and ready for future action. Um, the next one is discounting bias. And so this means that humans basically tend to prioritize or weight the present over the future. And so gains in the present uh, are valued over gains in the future. Losses in the present um, are sort of more important than losses in the future. And this manifests in all sorts of ways that have implications for the timeline of your forecast and how you might communicate losses or risks in the more distant future where addressing them would require present costs. Um, and so economists especially spend a lot of effort and time and write loads of papers uh, that are trying to understand kind of variability in people's individual discount rates is what they're called, sort of how quickly you discount the future and by how much. Um, and the last one I want to talk about is confirmation bias. And this one, I'm assuming we've heard about, especially in the context of social media more recently. Um, and it makes people basically look for information that is consistent with what they already think or what they already want or feel. Um, and this bias leads people to then, so even if they encounter um, other things, they might dismiss it or forget that information, and they do tend to avoid it to um, anything that would require them to change their minds. And so this might be important when you're thinking about the where and the how of communicating your forecast information. So here's a question. So a town has two hospitals. In ho This is a bit of a departure. So hospital A uh, in Hospital A, there are 45 babies born per day. In Hospital B, there are 15 babies born per day. Um, so as we know, right, generally there's about a 50-50 split with male and female babies, um, and uh, but every day it's not going to be exactly the same. And so the question here is which hospital is going to log more days per year when more than 60% of the babies born are male, sort of when you have an anomalously high number of males being born. Um, and for this, also please go to the Poll Everywhere um, site and fill in your answer. Okay, so this graphic here on the right is not about babies, but it is um, the results of a coin flip experiment, uh, sort of di digitally done randomized coin flip experiment uh, with a thousand observations. So running out to the right, we have the thousand observations and it shows how many heads, which is the bottom line or tails, top line were flipped. And though, though with a large sample size, the 50-50 probability is more apparent, small sample sizes are much more likely to have either heads or tails be dominant. So each day, Hospital B is basically flipping fewer coins and is therefore more likely to log an anomalously high number of male babies. So uh, the answer is Hospital B. Um, but, um, oh, and Hospital A, because it has a larger sample size, is less likely to have as skewed of a daily report. Um, but basically, most people answer this. Most people in sort of the, the public answer um answer that they should have about the same number of things because people are generally insensitive to sample size. Um, and so they tend to believe that the results taken from a small sample are just as reflective of underlying processes as are the results of a large sample. Sort of, so people tend to think more procedurally or process-based. So they, you know, there's no reason to think that more boys will be born at a small hospital. Therefore, um, you know, you, you should be able to see the same number of boys being born at a small hospital and a large hospital, right? There's not a process reason to think about that. Um, this is really a statistics question, and it's about sample size. And so um, generally, people are just insensitive to sample size. This is, of course, the right answer. Um, and so my point here is just when communicating your results, just be aware of this and make sure that your audience really understands the limitations and uncertainties of the forecast, because it's likely not going to be intuitive. For them. Oh, another pop quiz. Uh, so this is the end of the biases and heuristics section. And so the question here is, which of the following are true? And again, please go to poll everywhere to answer this question. So is A true? People use all prior data in predicting the future. B. People intuitively understand quantitative concepts like sample size and uncertainty. C. A thousand dollars is the same value uh, has the same value to people no matter if they're gaining it or losing it. A thousand dollars today is always the same as a thousand dollars in the future, in terms of valuation to people. Or last, none of these are true. Biases, heuristics, and inconsistencies abound. I should work with a social scientist to understand what they mean for my work. So 
moving on. So biases and heuristics occur mostly in our own minds. Um, but decisions and behavior also respond to the social and physical contexts in which they take place. For example, as this picture is showing, the um, so the decision to participate in like a voluntary recycling program is likely to relate to how easy and intuitive it is to recycle. Like your big blue bin, put your recyclables here, is a, is a central message. Um, and it'll also depend on relevant social norms about recycling. So social norms are uh, described by two related sets of expectations. So the first is empirical expectations, which refers to um, how a person expects other people to behave. So like, how many of my neighbors can I see recycling? That's my empirical expectation. What do I think other people are doing? Um, normative expect uh, expectations uh, relate to how we think other people want us to behave um, and how badly we think they'll punish us for doing the wrong thing. Um, and so this is more, you know, do I think that my neighbors want me to recycle? Um, and, you know, what are they going to do to me if I don't recycle? And so people conditionally prefer to adhere to social norms, given that they have the right expectations. They believe that most people are going to do it, and they believe that those people also want them to do it. So power and water companies, for example, are using social comparisons to give people information about empirical expectations. So this is, some of you might be familiar with this, I think this, I took this from my own power bill at one point. Um, and so the bars here at the top on the left are telling you both what your neighbors are doing in general, which is that bottom bar, um, and how the most efficient neighbors are doing, which is the top bar. Um, and how you compare, which is the middle bar. And this helps you to understand empirical expectations, sort of what are your neighbors doing? Um, and the first round of experiments actually stopped there. Uh, so this was actually an, ex so this was an experiment by power companies to try to get people to conserve energy. Um, and so the first round stopped there, hoping that by letting you know that some people were doing better than you, that that would encourage people to be more efficient. Um, and that did work for some people, but others looked at the bottom bar and saw that they were in the, mo or they saw that they were in the most efficient group and rather than kind of pat themselves on the back and double down on their efficiencies, instead they actually tended to relax and use more energy, which was unideal as far as the power companies were concerned. So the, the company added a set of um, personalized action steps to the, um, to the bill. And so this sort of reframed the expectation for people, implying that what others wanted you to do was to be even more efficient, even if you were in that kind of best group already, which is a kind of like their take on a normative implication or normative expectation. Um, but I will note here, so trying to influence or make use of social norms is really tricky to do from the outside. Uh, and this is because when we're thinking about expectations, uh, like we as individuals, when we're thinking about our expectations, empirical and normative, we're not we're not thinking about every, um, like all of the billions of people on this planet, right? We're not even thinking about the hundreds or thousands of people that we may know personally. Um, for each norm, there's a set of people to whom every individual refers, and that's called their reference group. And the reference group may be different for different behaviors. Actually, it's it's almost always different for different behaviors. Um, and so if I want to know how often I should mow my lawn, I will likely have a reference group that includes my my actual physical neighbors, people in my neighborhood. Um, my empirical expectations will refer, will refer to how many of them mow their lawns at a particular frequency, and my normative expectations will refer to how often I suspect my neighbors want me to mow my lawn, and also how I think they might censure me for violating those expectations. Um, and something like a disgusted look as they pass my property might be enough of a consequence for me to adhere to a particular mowing schedule, right? Not to let my lawn go to seed, for example. Um, but for how I behave on a Zoom call, like video on or off, are we raising our hands or clicking the icon for raising hands? Um, for this behavior, for these behaviors, I probably don't, I couldn't care less what my neighbors do or think. Uh, for this, my reference group is going to be colleagues, my, you know, my bosses, superiors, moderators of the Zoom call, etc. So we as a society are actually trying to work those particular norms out right now. Um, and they might differ from call to call, etc. But we're sort of trying to land on how, how, how do we Zoom correctly? Um, and so when thinking about social norms, it's also um, probably going to be important to think about observability or visibility of the action. So we tend to adhere to norms more strongly if we think we're being watched. Um, and interestingly, it doesn't actually have to be a member of our reference group who's watching us. It doesn't even have to be a real person, it turns out. 
So a study by Bateson and colleagues showed that even a picture of a pair of eyes was enough to increase the amount that people paid for coffee using the honor system. Um, and this was in a shared break, break room in their building. Um, and that those, so the, the, the weeks where an eye or a pair of eyes was being shown as these sort of the black dots where people are paying more for the coffee. Um, and they, in the control weeks, they used, um, they used a picture of flowers. Um, and so the observability signal seems to be linked to the importance uh, to people of maintaining their reputation, uh, which can be self-reflective. So refer to a person's strong motivation not to violate, to, not to violate aspects of their, um, their personal identity. Um, but we also adhere to norms to retain our position in, um, in a larger social structure. And sorry, there's a, a plane in the background if you can hear that. Um, but yeah, we want to maintain our social position and also, you know, not experience cognitive dissonance with sort of who we see ourselves as. Um, and so here you can just see a social norm in the making. This is a, a fabulous cartoon. Um, yeah, for those of you not familiar, this is Calvin and Hobbes. Um, and this particular one reminds me very strongly of my own childhood. So the physical context of decision making is um, is also really important, right? So this is at the place where people are making a decision. Uh, what sort of signals are they getting? And so, for example, many of us have probably stayed at a hotel in the in the past ten years or so uh, when these started being popular. And so this is on the right. You see this sort of um, message that can hang up on the towel stand, and it's about you know asking people really how often they want their towels washed and where to put towels if they want them washed or if they want to reuse them. And, you know, they might include some message about how, uh, you know, how much energy and water has to be used to wash the towels and how much you save. So this is a, this is trying to get people to make a sort of greener decision. And this is, um, uh, and so where these are placed makes a really big difference, right? These are not, they're not on the entrance materials when you, when you book your room. These are hanging physically next to the towels. So this is a physical reminder right where the decision is to be made. And they just ask you to sort of, hey, wait, stop, think, what are you doing? Um, maybe you should make a different decision. Um, the other um, type of physical context that I want to talk about is the idea of defaults. And defaults actually run the gamut. They, are, they tap into a whole bunch of different um, sort of some biases, some heuristics, um, but they also, uh, they occur at the physical space of the decision. So this is like when you're about to fill in a bubble to make your choice of something, when you're about to circle your answer. Um, if there's a default, it means there's something already selected. So if you don't actively change the default, that's going to be your decision. Um, and so in this example here, um, there's this, this was from a town in Massachusetts, their energy selection. So the, the, energy distribution on the left. So the standard um, mix of renewables included 51% renewable electricity as the default. So if you don't make a choice, that's the one that you end up choosing. Um, and then the second option that's provided is 100% renewables. And then towards the end is this sort of basic option in gray. Uh, so there are actually quite, quite a few kind of nudges going on in the same thing. They might also be using the anchoring bias with the sort of difference in prices at the bottom. Um, and um, and there are things like perceived authority here. They might be also indicating some sort of normative information about what your neighbors and the town kind of expect you to do. Um, but it's also it, sort of physically changing the, the location of decision making because there is a default already selected for you. So pop quiz again. Uh, so this you'll again go to poll every way to answer this. But this is just taking a, taking a guess. Which of the following do you think describes a person adhering to a social norm? Um, and so the first is a man walking across Com Ave until the signal shows, you know, the walk sign. Uh, and I apologize for most of you uh, who, if anyone hasn't been to Com Ave, it runs right through Boston University's campus and is a, a kind of notorious for being a lawless place where people are sort of moving all over the place. Um, so that's the first one. A man walk, waiting to cross Con Ave until the signal shows the, to walk. Uh, the second is a woman driving to a central composting site to compost her household food waste. Um, and a third is a child waiting to be excused from, uh, or asking to be excused from the dinner table. So if you can go over to the website and make a guess.
Okay. So. The final section is on risk perception. So many of the forecasts that we are building um, may be in a position to mitigate risk of some hazard or other. Um, and I use the term hazard throughout to refer to an event or process that may cause harm. Um, and so the risks associated uh, or addressed by ecological forecasts may be related to things like disease transmission, water shortages, contamination, crop mortality, lost recreational or tourism value, biodiversity loss, the presence of pests, etc. Um, and those risks are important. Uh, and so today I'm going to focus on two aspects of risk that are important to decision makers. So these two topics are central to risk perception work and relate to perceptions of quote unquote riskiness of hazards and perceptions of risk acceptability. So what is riskiness? What does that even mean? Why is that a word? Um, it doesn't sound specific. So early work on risk perception focused on the differences between expert judgments and lay judgments of risk. Uh, Paul Slovic was a pioneer in this field. So his and colleagues work showed that there were two, that the two groups, um, So his uh, and colleagues' work showed that these two groups generally ranked risks similarly uh, when it came to how likely they thought the hazard was to kill you in a given year, basically, uh, how sort of the, the mortality rate in a given year. They ranked those things very similarly, lay, lay, lay folks and experts. Um, but the difference came when the groups were asked to also rank hazards by their riskiness. Um, and so the experts basically kept their rankings. High likelihood of death meant more risky, less death, less risky. Um, but the general population actually changed a lot and thought very differently. And so it turns out that the public's percep perceptions of riskiness fall out along two primary axes, dread and unfamiliarity. So hazards that were more dreadful and less familiar tended to be the riskiest. And so dreadful events tend to be uncontrollable, catastrophic, fatal, and inequ inequitable in their risks and benefits. Sort of the distribution of risks and benefits is unequal. Uh, whereas unfamiliar events are unobservable, unknown to science, new in the public awareness, and have delayed effects. Um, and so the farther you are along these two axes, the more risky people generally perceive you to be um, as a hazard. And so the novel coronavirus actually right now would probably map pretty well onto both of these axes and be right up there in terms of riskiness. But the other side of risk perception relates to the idea of some level of risk being acceptable and accepted by society and by individuals. Um, so there, there are really good reasons to not try to live in a zero risk society. And we don't, we don't live in a zero risk society. Um, I don't know of any societies that are, that are zero risk. Um, so some risk acceptability arises because we have to expose ourselves to, to some hazard in order to reap benefits that are important to us. Uh, so for my dissertation, for example, I worked with farmers in eastern Uganda, and many of them found the very real risk of landslide. They lived in a, a sort of extinct volcano slope. Um, and so they had a very real risk of landslide that they saw. Um, and then though they found it alarming, it wasn't sufficient to offset the benefits of the rich soil, the cultural history that they had in that place, and the familiarity they had with their villages, all of which were kind of benefits. Um, so our sense of how acceptable risk is also relates to the affect heuristic or how our feelings mediate, mediate our, um, our risk response. So feelings like fear, anxiety, or happiness uh, all affect decisions through the affect heuristic. Um, so George Lewinstein and, um, and his colleagues wrote an incredibly influential paper back in 2001 that revolutionized how the academic community modeled risk behavior. So basically their group added feelings in as a, as, a, as a sort of causal marker. So their group argued that feelings had a direct role to play in our risk-related decisions and behavior, pushing back on previous models that argued that cognitive or rational evaluation, so that sort of top box, that cognitive evaluation produced both feelings and behavior independently. And feelings sort of were an offshoot, but not a driver. Um, and so this was, this was very influential and correct. So the perceived acceptability of risk is also mediated, mediated by who people feel is responsible for addressing the risk, uh, which is called the locus of responsibility, and also the related locus of control. So locus of control refers to how confident a person feels that they have control over what happens in their lives. 
Um, and so when people have a strong internal locus of control and an inter internal locus of responsibility, they're more likely to accept higher levels of risk, but also to take protective actions to mitigate that risk. So they might engage more in risk, but they also sort of do something about it. Um, so the ways in which people perceive riskiness uh, and acceptability do not reflect pure probabilistic realities, um, which is perhaps intuitive, but important to understand. Um, and so in communicating risk or risk mitigation potential that comes from ecological forecasts, any combination of these might kind of come into play. So think about that. Um, so when you're thinking about developing a forecast that may be or that you hope will be used in a decision-making context, just try to keep some of these in mind. Uh, the biases and mental shortcuts that are hardwired into our minds interact with the social and physical context that, we, um, that we're sitting in when we make decisions. Um, and this is all layered over feelings and trade-offs that we associate with the risks that you might be talking about in your forecasts. And so working with a social scientist might help you sort out which of these might be at play in your specific context. And I'd also give you tools to how to address them uh, in the design and communication of your work. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions or, or talk offline.